The presenter is named Erica Berkman. He's the president of the NAP Club. He's a NAP major. And he's going to be doing a talk on the construction of the national numbers. And this is the first student program ever because we just started it. So you enjoy it. Here you go. Hello, everybody. As you've heard, my name is Eric Maverchik, and today we'll be constructing the natural numbers. So, since this is a mathematics colloquia, I feel that it would be good if we had some kind of definition of mathematics before we began. So I'm going to present a very loose definition of mathematics, so that we get a feel for the spirit of how mathematics is and how mathematics does. So first, in order to define mathematics, I would first like to define how to study something mathematically. What is the process of studying mathematics? So we say that a subject is studied mathematically when the subject is broken down into atomic concepts and the rest of the subject is described from the atomic concepts. We say that a statement about a subject studied mathematically is knowledge if there is a proof of its validity. So let's see an example of what I mean by these things. So take the subject of geometry. The atomic concepts of geometry are point, line, and incidence. We describe everything else in terms of these, and this is how we study them. So when we talk about a triangle, we say that a triangle is made by joining three lines between three non-collinear points. So we define things in terms of the smaller previous previously defined points. So an example of knowledge in geometry is that the sum of angles of a triangle is always less than or equal to 180 degrees. You can prove this statement is true. So this is why we call this knowledge. So, drum roll, the definition of mathematics as a subject is a collection of all knowledge studied mathematically. This is very loose. There might be things that people don't consider math in here, but I want this as a general idea of mathematics. So, today we will be constructing the natural numbers, so I, I want to get us introduced to what these things are. So what's so important about the natural numbers? First, let's talk about where they come from. Now, when I look out at things, objects around me, and I see a red house, a red table, and a red chair, there's a quality that these things share called red. We call it red. Now, when I stare at objects, and I see a table, a chair, and a door, they have a property that they share called their quantity, which is one, a single one. So this is where the concepts of numbers begin coming from, of seeing lots of different groups of things and noticing that they have something in common called their quantity. And then the concept of zero comes from nothing. But this is introduced later. Natural numbers are important because this is what the origin of mathematics comes from. Throughout history, mathematics begins in countries when people first start recognizing numbers. They start giving symbols for numbers. So the natural numbers are very important because mathematics begins with these numbers. The prime numbers are very important. The most important question in mathematics is the Riemann hypothesis, which talks about the distribution of the prime numbers. And the prime numbers are a subset of the natural numbers. These are very important objects that we're considering here. And for those who are introduced to more modern mathematics, we know that from the natural numbers, we're able to construct all of the other sets of numbers that we like to consider, like the integers, the rational numbers, the real numbers, and the complex numbers. These can all be constructed from the natural numbers. So these play a very important role. So today we will show that the natural numbers can be constructed themselves. And is the point of the presentation. Now, many people throughout history have considered numbers sacred such as the Pythagoreans. When, the, when someone was spreading news that the square root of two was irrational, the Pythagorean school killed this guy because they were obsessed with numbers. Numerology uh, assigned everybody a number, and this told things about your future. They were very religious. So numbers have been considered sacred by mathematicians throughout time. An example of a person like this is Leopold Kronecker. He's, he uh, is quoted to have said that God created the natural number, and the rest is the work of man. And this is how many mathematicians view the natural numbers, as being God-given. They're already there. We just take them for granted. So what are we constructing today? 
How would you know what a natural number looks like? If I had a natural number in your face, would how, what qualities about it would allow you to know this is a natural number? Luckily, we have a mathematician by the name of Piano, Giuseppe Piano. He is the first person to be accredited to study the natural numbers mathematically because he came up with his axioms of the natural numbers. Piano studied the natural numbers and asked himself, what properties do the natural numbers have? So we have these. His axioms of the natural numbers are first. There exists a number, and we call it zero. First axiom. This makes sense. Every number has a successor. This in mind is saying two, the successor is three. Five, the successor is six. So numbers have successors. The next one is that zero has no successor. No number will have a successor at zero. And we're, we're not thinking of negative numbers here. We're not, because, yeah, like two goes to three, we don't, we're not considering negative one here. Also, no two numbers have the same successor. The successor of three is not the successor of seven, and etc. Now the last statement here is the statement of induction which I will not be going over this in my construction today because I feel that this would take a long time for me to go through. But I will state it here for everybody. If a statement P is true for 1, N, and N plus 1, then we know that this is going to be true for the rest of the numbers. We call this mathematical deduction. This is how mathematicians do a lot of proofs. So engraved in the natural numbers is mathematical induction, a very powerful tool in mathematics. So this is what Piano says that the natural numbers look like. When I look at the natural numbers, I see these properties of them. These are the axioms of the natural numbers. So now if we're going to begin constructing these things, we're going to need to first understand the language of mathematics, the language that we will be constructing these things in. Now the atomic concepts of set theory are classes and elements. A class is an arbitrary collection. It's the, the idea of just having a collection of things a so, a so, by a rule called the rule of the class. So a class would be all numbers bigger than five. This is a collection of things given by a rule. An element is what is the, it, an element is something that has the property defined by the class. So the number seven fulfills the property that it is greater than five. So we would say seven is an element of the class defined by the rule numbers greater than five. So this is the atomic concepts of set theory. Now here is some notation. This is the symbol for the rational numbers. And we would read this as follows. The set containing all a divided by b such that b is non-zero, such that b is non-zero and b and a are both integers. This is how we define the rational number. And this is the notation that we use in set theory. The class of rational numbers. So now a set is what we're interested in. Sets are the good things. So we have this primitive concept of a class. So what is a set? A set is a class that can be proven to exist. I will talk more about this in a few minutes. So why do we have to define a set like this? Why can't we say a set is just a collection of elements? Wouldn't that be easier? We'd have less things to talk about. Well, fortunately for us, we live in the future where we know about the bad classes. Consider this class. It's a collection of elements assorted by a rule. The rule is that x is not an element of itself. This is the symbol for element, as we saw earlier. So, theorem one. The Russell class is not a set. So now we will prove this statement, and this will be our first example of knowledge today. Assume that the Russell class is a set. So we have two options. If R is an element of itself, this means it satisfies the rule that X is not an element of X. But then R is not an R. We have two contradictory statements being true at the same time. So this can't possibly happen. Our only other option is R is not an element of R. But this is the defining property of the Russell class. So R must be an R, but again, we're running into contradiction. So by law of the excluded middle, a statement or the negation of the statement must be true. We've shown that both of these can't possibly be true. 
So our first assumption that the Russell class was a set is false. QBD. This is our first example of knowledge. So, thanks to the mathematicians in the early 19th century, the 20th century, we now have rules of which we can make sets that we consider good. The, they're called the axioms of set theory. How to make good sets. Sets that aren't like the Russell class. Sets that could be shown to be contradictory if they exist. So we have these rules to make sure that the things we're considering are good and aren't ridiculous. So these are very specific rules. So our first axiom is existence. You have to know something exists if you want to start talking about it. If you don't know it exists, where do you begin? So we have to first postulate that a set does exist. Next, we have extensionality, which says two sets are equal if they have the same elements. We would read here now, this is a logical location. This symbol means for every x, for every y. So for any two sets, if an element of x is always an element of y, and vice versa, the sets are equal. This is how we interpret this logical statement. So this is called the axiom of extensionality. Next, we have the axiom of pairing. For every x, for every y, there exists a z, such that x is in z and y is in z. So if a and b are sets, there's some other set c that contains these, and we use this notation to denote this. The, the fourth axiom is comprehension. It says, for every x, for every p of x, this is a statement about elements of x. There exists another set y, such that for every w, w is in y, if and only if w is in x, and p is true about w. So in more colloquial terms, given a set x and a rule to associate a subset, uh, some, co some collection of elements inside of x, then this subset does exist. So this is a very powerful axiom we have here. If you know that a set exists, you know that all of its subsets exist. This is a lot more powerful than this one, one might say. Now, the last axiom that I will be needing today in order to do this is going to be the union axiom. It says that this one is a little tricky. For every x, there exists a z, such that for every w in z, all the elements of here, there's going to be an element t inside of x that w is inside of. So given a set x, it's very confusing. It's like you have to stare at it for a couple times, bang your head on the wall, and maybe you'll get it. So given a set x, there exists a set that contains the elements of the elements of x. 